Good morning and welcome to the inaugural session of MOD's Level Up to Equality quarterly webinar. Uh, we plan on doing these types of trainings every quarter uh, and we have some topics that we'll talk about as we um, towards the end that we are looking for some further suggestions as well. So good morning. Uh, I am Jeffrey Dugan. I'm the Assistant Director for Community Services and I'll be emceeing this webinar but I'll also be presenting uh, on the main topic today which focuses on ensuring outdoor dining is accessible to all. I'd also like to give a shout out to my colleagues working their magic in the background. Uh, if we have time at the end, maybe they can introduce themselves. A quick, a quick note, uh, this event is being recorded. And if all goes well on the technical side of things, uh, will be posted in our YouTube page in the very near future. We have a lot of information to cover today in this, in this uh, really one hour session. Um, so we have divided the agenda into four sections. Um, first, we will begin with some MOD related updates and initiatives, then we'll transition into the main topics for ensuring outdoor dining is accessible to all. Uh, after the main topic is covered, we will have a question and answer session towards the end of the event. However, before we start, I would like Moss Lynch, MOD's Assistant Director for Training and Communication, uh, to discuss some of the virtual housekeeping items. Uh, Moss, if you are able to turn on your camera. I'll turn off mine. And thank you, Moss, you can begin. Hi, Jeff, thank you. Can we just go to the next slide, please? So for closed captioning, everybody, we ask that you go down to the bottom of your screen and you turn on your closed captioning. Also posted in the chat is a link to external captions as well. During the event, we have the question and answer feature enabled, which is at the bottom of your screen. We will not be answering questions during the event, but we will be leaving time at the end of the event for questions. So we ask that when you send your question, you please include your name, email address, phone number, and be very specific with what your question is. Again, we will be answering these questions at the end. So they need to be specific to each individual part of the presentation so we can best answer those. If we're unable to answer your question during the event, we will personally follow up with you as soon as possible after the event. For additional resources, please refer, uh, refer to the Zoom support document that we sent you, which was emailed with your event link. And with that, I'll turn it back over to you, Jeff. Thank you. Thank you, Moss. If you could turn off your video. Um, let me just put my spot. Oh, I think I'm spotlighted back. Perfect. So let's get back to the train. So MOD, uh, our office, the Massachusetts Office on Disability, serves as a resource to state agencies, municipal governments, and members of the public. We offer information, training, and guidance on matters concerning disability related to civil rights, equal access, and opportunity. MOD also, our mission statement, is linked to our establishing legislation, which, which is to bring about full and equal participation of people with disabilities in all aspects of life in a manner that fosters dignity and self-determination. And MOD also through the Executive Order 592 serves as the executive branch's designated ADA and Rehabilitation Act coordinator. Some of the duties, uh, I'm not gonna go through all of them, but some of the duties, just to name a few, uh, are uh, as our role as the executive branch's designated ADA coordinator, MOD onboards newly designated state ADA coordinators, provides ongoing training and technical guidance to the ADA coordinators at state agencies. MOD also serves on the Massachusetts Architectural Access Board. We also administer the Municipal ADA Improvement Grant Program that provides municipalities with financial resources uh, to remove architectural and communication barriers to improve accessibility within the community. We also, uh, MOD, serves as a lead technical advisor to local commissions on disabilities. And we regularly will attend and provide guidance, uh, technical assistance to those local commissions. In Massachusetts, we have just over 200 commissions on disabilities uh, set up and established throughout the Commonwealth. MOD also houses the Client Assistance Program, also known as CAP, C-A-P, uh, which is a federal grant through rehabilitation services a service administration to provide information and advice and advocacy to people with disabilities who have concerns about receiving services from the VOC Rehab Rehabilitation Agencies or their local independent living center service. 
MOD also runs the personal emergency preparedness uh, program that educates people with disabilities on how to individually prepare for an emergency uh, with, an with the assistance uh, of the local first responders. Uh, since 2007, um, we've held, uh, and I've lost count, but we've held over 300, if not 400 trainings throughout the Commonwealth. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more of that a little bit later on. Uh, the, our ADA, uh, I'm sorry, MOD also serves as the, as the Massachusetts affiliate to the, to the New England ADA Center, which covers the New England ADA states and serves as one of the 10 ADA information centers throughout the country. And we as MOD serve as their affiliate. I would like to now turn it over to Mary Mahan McCauley, our esteemed executive director to officially welcome everyone. And Mary, when you are ready, can you turn on your camera? Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you very much, Jeff. Uh, just to name a few other things that MOD is involved in, and um, it is wonderful. Um, we have such a long list of involvements and it's, the work is done with, by 13 people, which is, which is quite amazing. But we are also on the Massachusetts Developmental I Disability will. Council I will. and the 911 Commission of Massachusetts. So we, we sit on various boards and, and commissions around the state uh, and our main objective um, is really to ensure that people with disabilities have equal participation in all aspects of life within the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, whether they're residents or visitors in Massachusetts. Matt, and, Mary, I'm sorry to interrupt, but can we pause? Apparently we're having concerns that the closed captioning isn't working. So can we just pause for a moment and see if that can be resolved? And uh, I see the closed captions coming in just fine. Okay. Hi, this is Moss. The issue that we're having, and we've gotten some complaints in the Q&A, is that the link to the caption streaming is not working. It's bringing up a blank page. Okay, hold on a minute, please. Okay. Check on that. I have a full page. Uh, let me give you this again in the chat, but I have a full page here. So uh, perhaps the link was incorrect. Uh, let's see. Uh, I'll put it in the closed captioning here, this link. I just put it in the meeting itself. It's in the closed captioning transcript. Thank you. And would you please post that in the chat as well? Uh, yes, please. Uh, yes, definitely. <laughs> uh, here it is. Okay, before we start, Mary, I just wanna make sure that's all up and running, it should be. So Mary, if you can continue, I'm sorry for interrupting. No, th that's fine, Jeff. And um, let me also apologize to everyone watching. I, I know, you know, pre-COVID-19, all of the employees around the Commonwealth of Massachusetts did not have to be audio visual experts. And there's, mm -hmm. we've learned a lot and it's absolutely gotten more difficult with COVID, but. Um, we planned a lot of these things out and sorry, there's technical, little, some technical problems. But let me get back to what I was saying that um, the main objective or one of the main objectives of the Massachusetts Office on Disability is to ensure equal access for people with disabilities in all aspects of life within Massachusetts. And as I was saying, that's been a, a critical piece of what I've lived for my whole life. In the 1970s, I was involved with disability rights movements, all pre-Americans with Disabilities Act, and it was all about equal participation. And I am really happy to invite everyone today to our Level Up to Equality webinar. We'll be having quarterly webinars, and today's is specifically oh. about outdoor dining. I know I personally am super excited that the weather's getting nicer, people are getting their vaccines, and there's going to be more outdoor dining. So um, please listen and, and listen and learn. I think most restaurants want to do their best to make sure that they're opening their doors or opening their sidewalks or parking lots or street curbs uh, to all people to really increase their profit margin. Um, people with disabilities have money and want to go to restaurants and need accessibility as everyone else. So thank you for joining us today. And I'm going to turn this over to Naomi Goldberg, who is the Assistant Director of Disability Rights. 
and also oversees the client assistance program or CAP program. Thank you. And Naomi, if you can unmute, you've been spotlighted, so you are ready to go. Oh, sorry about that after all of this. <laughs> um, hello. So for those of you who are not familiar with the Disability Rights Unit at MOD, we're the part of the agency that provides information and technical guidance on disability rights related matters. And we also house the client assistance program. And Jeff mentioned that um, the focus is on, ensuring, is on ensuring that people with disabilities can access either the vocational rehabilitation services that the Mass Rehab Commission and Mass Commission for the Blind or independent living services from the independent living centers. So um, the slide sort of tells what we generally do. And so I'll just talk about over the past year what we've been doing, uh, continuing to offer technical guidance on how various disability related laws apply to particular situations and whether uh, whether that's discussing it from the perspective of a person with a disability who wants to know about their rights or a government entity or a business wanting to understand their obligations, um, we're talking to, to both. Uh, we spoke to a lot of people this year, a lot of employees with disabilities who had concerns about returning to work in consideration of the pandemic and their particular limitations. And, you know, people were having difficulty trying to navigate conversations around return and reasonable accommodations and what is and isn't essential. We also interacted with a lot of entities, either government agencies or businesses who were changing their operations due to the pandemic and wanted to understand what their obligations were around and modifying policies and practices um, so that people with disabilities could equally participate. We always recognize uh, the need for people to access information in a way that's accurate and easy to understand. So during the past year, we've really focused on that. We've been busy overhauling our website, so please feel free to check that out. Um, I think the link will be included later. And we've also begun working on creating guidance ma materials um, that address various disability related rights uh, subjects and um, mostly ones that are pretty complicated or we people have common questions about them. And our ultimate goal in producing this kind of guidance and information on our website is to make these subjects easier to understand, offering tips um, for s resolving issues and including examples beyond just the common examples that we often find in, in, in around these topics that just discuss the very easiest accommodations that could be provided, for example. We wanna make it a little bit um, easier for people to navigate on their own, although we're here as a resource. Um, so as I mentioned, the, the client assistance program is um, part of the disability rights unit, the other piece of it. And um, as we mentioned, it focuses on uh, vocational rehabilitation services and independent living services. And we have a grant from the federal government um, and we serve as sort of an outside ombuds program for people who are either applying uh, for these types of services or currently receiving them and have concerns about them. Uh, every state has a CAP program in, in Massachusetts. It's housed at MOD. So we continue to assist individuals who have concerns about their services. We also continue to look at what systemic issues might people might be facing within these programs, and we work to resolve those as well. Uh, over the past year, one very exciting thing that CAP has done is we've developed an interactive um, disability disclosure and employment series. It will include eventually three separate workshops that we're doing over Zoom. Uh, the first workshop is called The Decision to Disclose, and it focuses how uh, it focuses on how a person with a disability decides whether to disclose their disability at different stages of the employment process. And uh, the participants will discuss the advantages and disadvantages of the disclosure and how much to share. And um, it's an interactive workshop, so it's uh, we do it in small groups. Right now we're holding them um, one day each month. We have two sessions, so we encourage people to uh, sign up. And um, we are going to be offering the next set in the series, which will be available in the summer, is focusing on reasonable accommodation, and there'll be a later one on discrimination. So um, hope to see you guys there. Thanks. And, and thank you, Naomi, if you can turn off your video. 
spotlight. Sorry, and we're switching screen. interpreters now. Okay. So I will hold for that. And let me just make sure we ever gonna get spotlighted appropriately, which I think is all set. Yes. Okay, so perfect. Um, so uh, let me sorry, come back to this. So uh, I'd like to so for me, I would like to discuss uh, quickly some of the big exciting items going on uh, with uh, I'm sorry, within my unit, uh, the community services unit. Uh, we've been continuing to conduct uh, those personal emergency preparedness trainings, which I alluded to earlier throughout the Commonwealth, but we're holding them virtually at this time in, in response to the pandemic. During the pandemic, Evan Excuse George. Me, oh, yes. Need to pause for a moment. We've lost ASL. Okay. I, I see ASL there. There we go. Is that better? Perfect. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Uh, okay, so uh, during the pandemic, Evan George, uh, the program training coordinator for that uh, emergency preparedness program, has held over close to 30 trainings uh, virtually, interacting with over 900 individuals. Of, that, of those 900, over 850 individuals were persons with disabilities. And as a result, we've distributed, or Evan has distributed, over 840 emergency supplied go kits uh, directly to those individuals with disabilities that attended the trainings. I'm also excited to share that we're continuing our work on the current FY21 cycle of the ADA Improvement Grant Program that we run here at MOD, and we look forward to opening the FY22 season in August. Uh, Carl Bryan, uh, uh, Carl Bryan, I'm sorry, the Grant Compliance Coordinator, uh, has been working very hard to assist communities with the applications, with questions, and with guidance throughout the program. In an FY21, we've uh, allocated or we've awarded 38 grants to 35 separate communities uh, that provided close to $1.9 million that gets funneled back to the communities to work on ADA improvements, whether it be architectural in nature or whether it be communication in nature. Um, for the CAM training that we've uh, offered uh, since the early 80s uh, is, is and will be converted to a digital format uh, and we'll begin uh, planning full online trainings later this year. So keep an eye out for the notifications, along with checking our website as additional trainings get scheduled. And finally, I continue to meet with the Commissions on Disabilities throughout the Commonwealth, again, albeit virtually at this time. Uh, over the past year, I've attended and presented at over 25 commission meetings and more are being scheduled at this time. Uh, so with that, let's get into why we're all here. And I, I appreciate everyone uh, attending this training. So I want to share with you that there are, I've included a, this slide as a reminder of, uh, at least for me, how much uh, I love dining out in all the favorite restaurants. Um, the three photos here show three different meals uh, to kind of get us ready for discussing the outdoor dining scenario. So we start off with a plate of quiche, fried chicken, and potato salad. We have another plate with some grilled salmon over a, another, it looks like, uh, avocado salad maybe. And for dessert, we have a cup of frozen yogurt with some chocolate sauce, peanut butter cups, and questionably, we have some strawberry syrup on the top. I'm not sure why one would put strawberry with that, but each their own. So now that we all are a little bit hungrier, uh, let's get to the topic at hand that we want to discuss today. So before we begin our discussion, I really do simply want to start with defining what a parklet actually is. A parklet are small seating areas or some green spaces uh, created as a public amenity on or along uh, a sidewalk. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, alongside a sidewalk. Typically, parklets are located in former roadside parking spaces. And as you can, the picture in the lower right of the slide shows a typical setup uh, as there are three tables that took over some on-street parking um, and are located in the prior existing parking spaces with plastic jersey barriers separating the parklet from the vehicular lanes. For this type of amenity and service, there are overarching obligations that need to be considered to ensure that these dining features are accessible to and usable by individuals with disabilities. Uh, all of the items here that are listed on this slide, and we'll touch upon them, they are all linked together. Uh, while we'll be discussing a lot of things today, there is never enough time to cover everything, so please raise a question uh, in the question and answer section. We'll do our best to answer it at the end of this event or after the event. Uh, please refer to slide three in this slideshow uh, for how the Q&A should be utilized. 
while again, while we'll be discussing a lot of architectural considerations, we would be remiss if we didn't also mention some of the ADA overarching non-discrimination obligations that apply to this scenario, as well as ensuring effective communication is had uh, in these scenarios as well. So ensuring non-discrimination, we have to look at two separate things here uh, because we have multiple parties involved. We not only have the business, but we'll also have municipality involvement. So on the business perspective, under Title III of the ADA, uh, it prohibits discrimination on the basis of disability in the activities of places of public accommodation and, and oftentimes requires newly constructed, well, and requires, I'm sorry, newly constructed and altered places to comply with the ADA design standards uh, while requiring existing buildings or elements constructed prior to 1991 comply with what is known as the readily achievable barrier removal obligation. Now, Title II is that for state and local government, and Title II of the ADA requires that people with disabilities uh, are provided an equal opportunity to participate in a public entity's programs, services, and activities in the most integrated manner appropriate and is not reliant on construction or altered elements. Uh, and this is also known as programmatic access. So for Title II, they require all program services and activities to be accessible by default. Um, and if uh, structural changes are needed, those programs also need to be provided accessibly uh, until such structural changes are provided. And these are really two pretty different high level obligations to just think about. And I'm, and I'm mentioning this for a reason, we'll circle back to it in a minute, but, um, but I wanna continue on with the effective communication and ensuring that effective communication can be had. Uh, and there are a lot of items that can be covered here, but for this topic today, uh, the obligations for effective communication falls to the, uh, falls to the business offering those amenities. So while the ADA amendments uh, in 2008 now requires the Title III entities to, while not necessarily obligated to provide the requested communication options, options they are required to ensure that effective communication can be had. So for example, if someone uh, requests bra a braille menu, a business may choose, as long as it works for the individual making that request, to meet that request by having a staff person read the menu or have a menu on tape or some other method of providing that information effectively to the individual who made the request. And additionally, if there is, uh, if there is wayfinding signage or instructional signage to help guide people, you know, you want to ensure the message being displayed is, is clear, both understanding wise, and that it's, you know, proper character dimensions for people to see from a distance, as well as ensuring that the text on the background uh, is, is, has, has significant contrast to it, so it can actually be utilized effectively and for its intent. You also want to consider, or things to also be considered for the business side of things is ensuring that websites are accessible to ensure that effective communi communication can be had with that communication avenue as items like reservation processes, menus, ordering options, and other uh, considerations to assist with messaging and understanding the business's operations is available and provided to the patrons and guests who, who will be visiting. If people can make reservations, order for curbside pickup uh, or delivery, you know, these options should be accessible as well in the various me methods that you are providing. The ADA obligations as most parklets and outdoor dining for restaurants, cafes and other businesses are approved and licensed by the local municipality. Oftentimes through municipal boards such as uh, planning boards, zoning boards, building departments, highway and the associated DPW boards, parking. Both Title II of the ADA applies which requires programmatic access as well as Title III of the ADA, which requires readily achievable barrier removal. As a community issues permits for outdoor dining, ac uh, access responsibilities are required, most likely with the accessibility responsibilities falling to the business to implement. Without the appropriate access provisions, either the architecturally um, or communication-based, both the community and the business would be linked or held liable if there were to be a Department of Justice complaint uh, filed. This is why the municipal review process and the interaction guidance and implementation strategies with the business is really truly essential in this process. Continuing on, looking at now the stuff that looks like building codes, the 2010 ADA design standards are federal civil rights regulations that address access within the built environment. 
as the outdoor dining is something being created, uh, under these regulations, parklets and outdoor dining areas are considered new elements, and in fact would be considered as a new primary function area of that business and have specific obligations that we'll discuss a little bit later on in this presentation. We then look to the 2006 Massachusetts Architectural Access Board, and these are specialized state building codes designated to make public buildings, which include sidewalks and the parklets, uh, accessible to, functional for, and safe for persons with, with disabilities. Like the 2010 ADA design standards, as outdoor dining elements are created, the regulations consider these elements new construction and will have specific obligations, again, to be discussed later in, in this presentation. Both the 2010 ADA design standards and the 2006 AAB regulations provide technical obligations that are considered minimum compliance. For example, a curb ramp's running slope should not exceed 8.33%, or rather one inch of rise and 12 inches of run. Anything steeper is non-compliant and, and nothing is preventing a less steep slope. And in fact, both of the codes or both of the regulations call for the least possible slope should be used for any ramp. And then they go on to list the maximum uh, as the maximum level or, or maximum uh, slopes that can be provided. Obviously, if we can aim for better, that is. That is a great option and, and avenue. Uh, just, you know, not just following the minimums that, that are listed. It will make an establishment more welcoming uh, and inviting to the patrons and guests you're inviting. Now, on top of all of those obligations, we also have to consider COVID-19 mandates and guidances. As the mandates and guidance provided during the pandemic in the Commonwealth state of emergency, uh, these are changing frequently. Uh, the process uh, of effectively ensuring accessibility to the outdoor dining locations must also consider the guidances or mandates related to this emergency uh, and related to this program, this, um, the outdoor dining scenarios. In this narrow topic of outdoor dining and seating that we are talking about today, the ADA and the associated design standards, along with the 2006 revision of the Architectural Access Board's regulations, they all need to work together to ensure that the most comprehensive requirement is being met. Oftentimes, but never always, uh, the AAB is equal to or more stringent than that of the ADA design standards when relating to structural accessibility within this scenario. The ADA uh, Act as civil rights legislation uh, does cover all aspects of equal access and participation and sets the obligations for other non-structural aspects of the Act including but not limited to ensuring that effective communication uh, and accommodating or modifying a policy to ensure someone can fully or equally participate. Again, these are all linked together for the outdoor dining topic. So you can see how it can become pretty confusing if a business is trying to do this on their own or if a municipality is just granting a blanket license uh, for outdoor dining, there really needs to be some collaboration and working together to ensure that all of these uh, obligations are being met and considered. I am now uh, switching gears to focus on specifically on sidewalk accessibility considerations for outdoor dining and seating uh, and some of the obligations that must be considered. So while I'm not going to be able to cover every single dimension of every element that required to be accessible, I will be discussing the most common ones that, are, that must be considered, along with providing you the collective obligations based on the 2010 ADA design standards and the 2006 uh, AAB regulations. Now, the, the one topic that I wanna start with is really the, the discussion of the obligations of an accessible route. This translates to not only the on-sidewalk outdoor dining, but it will also cover off-street uh, dining, as well as um, newly created, uh, you might have, uh, seating um, in a park or in a, or in a, um, or on a, a field. So first though, I'm gonna, I'm gonna focus on on sidewalk and some of these things you're gonna find will carry over. So for accessible routes, wherever people need to travel to get to an element that is provided, those pathways or routes need to also be accessible and compliant with the codes. Remember, as these elements are new, both the AAB and the ADA design standards would require not only the element to be accessible, but the routes to those new elements also be accessible. Remember Title II licensing and approval, most businesses do not control the sidewalks 
or the parking spaces. So this is where the, the town would might need to get involved to assist with that. Uh, this is where the municipality must work with the business in choosing locations of where those elements are going to be located for outdoor dining, not only for access, uh, but also for public safety and maintained use. So this could mean if the existing sidewalk is in disrepair uh, or would not accommodate the 36 inch uh, needed accessible route around the tables, uh, a community might want to consider shutting down a street <clears throat> to allow for outdoor dining in a more spacious and controlled setting or area. We've all seen communities, uh, are, I'm sorry, we've also seen communities approach the Architectural Access Board for temporary relief during the pandemic, which is tied to the governor's state of emergency. For example, and I'm gonna pick on Boston a little bit, they were approved for a blanket variance related to the use of temporary ramps at curbs. Uh, they also got some blanket relief related to outdoor dining uh, as it relates, and I'm gonna use Boston Common as an example that's mostly uh, connected there, where tables might uh, would be provided on the asphalt walks, while others close by may be provided on grass. So the accessible tables would be uh, in the same area and same section of those tables, whether they be on grass or pavement, uh, but they would be close together and, and, and linked there. Again, each location in each community's process is going to be different. So this is something that in order to ensure access is provided must be part of the process from the start. The accessible route to dive into it a little bit deeper must coincide with that of the general public uh, and must meet specific dimensions. So for example, uh, an accessible route must be stable firm and slip resistant and maintained with materials that ensured continued slip resistant. Uh, an accessible route must provide a width uh, of no less than 48 inches wide that can be reduced to 36 inches for short sections. If turns around an obstruction, uh, think the end of a library stack, uh, must, approve, uh, must provide the appropriate clear width which could differ from 36 inches to 42 inches around that obstruction. And again, we have uh, th those citations can be found easily and we can answer those later if needed. Uh, and it must be free from changes in the level uh, that are over a quarter inch. Uh, anything from a quarter inch to a half inch uh, must be beveled. Anything over a half inch, which is sloped slightly, uh, and then anything over a half inch is, must be remedied uh, uh, either by ramp or, or other solution or other, it could be uh, repaving that specific section. So you wanna be cognizant of those various things that there's the width is correct, that if you have to maneuver around obstructions or make cheap turns, that those dimensions also comply, as well as ensuring that there aren't changes in level uh, uh, along the route. Uh, another responsibility is to ensure that the accessible route from non-dining patrons um, check in, uh, I'm sorry, uh, we wanna ensure that the accessible routes to where patrons check in, the routes to the tables, a route to exit, uh, as well as any other elements on site, such as the routes to the restrooms, the bar, the heating and cooling options, uh, or self-serve drink stations. Uh, on top of that, uh, an, an additional responsibility is to ensure that the accessible route from, for non-dining patrons is also provided. Is there a 36 inch clear accessible route? Um, provided for people to pass the dine, outdoor dining sections without having to leave the sidewalk? Um, are there extension cords laid across the sidewalk for lights, fans, or terminals? Uh, those loose cords can be a tripping hazards and need to be covered to reduce tripping hazards. And oftentimes there are these little plastic portable ramps with a cord section underneath uh, that could remedy that, that issue. So it provides a stable and a, a slope surface over those extension cords that might be powering uh, various items related to the outdoor dining section. Also having clear and easy to understand language, uh, wayfinding or instructional signs, as we discussed on the previous slide, will assist with some of the communication access requirements and also help your, assist the patrons who are visiting. And the last thing to mention here is to ensure that protruding objects do not project out into the accessible route. Uh, for objects, uh, projecting from walls with their leading edges between 27 inches and 80 inches off the floor. Those must not project more than four inches into the accessible route. On top of that, if they're mounted, uh, if signs are mounted on posts or pylons, which we will see on sidewalks, um, they may have a maximum overhang of 12 inches between that same height range. 
So using this photograph as an example, where, the, where we have outdoor dining uh, for one restaurant that hugs the restaurant, the building side. We also further down, if you can see, we have um, some outdoor dining that is on the, the street side, more, more to the street side, but still on sidewalk. And those particular outdoor dining have uh, umbrellas covering the tables. I, or we would, or whoever put those out there would need to double check to make sure that those umbrellas are not projecting out into the accessible route uh, if they are lower than 80 inches. And if they project out from the table's edge more than four inches, then those are, uh, would be considered protruding objects. And while the umbrellas here are attached to tables, uh, and as I mentioned, the measurement is from the table edge out to see if it overhangs more than four inches in this scenario. Uh, and please remember, we do have a question and answer section uh, if there are questions. So I am now going to start progressing and moving to the off sidewalk access considerations uh, to be considered as well. I am also, um, uh, we will be also discussing the actual dimensions coming up soon for what tables and chairs and things like that would look like. So I'm gonna move into the off sidewalk access considerations and this could be for parklets, uh, street dining or dining in a park. Uh, after that, we'll begin discussing the dimensions of specific elements. Um, let me see what move. Okay, there we go. So let me start by discussing the two pictures that are on this slide. Uh, the top picture shows an on sidewalk dining. Uh, both the front and the rear of the sidewalk are, have the tables and seating uh, with a path down the middle while also providing off sidewalk parklet in an on-street parking space. Uh, while I can only see this static photo, I would like to point out that from the sidewalk to the parklet, there is a flush transition. And while this design, and with this design, the parklet is built on a platform that aligns with the curbing of the adjacent sidewalk. And now someone does not need to step off the sidewalk, nor would someone need to access the, or ask for the portable ramp to be deployed or locate the closest curb cut, travel street back to the parklet. This allows someone, uh, if it wasn't flush, somebody would have to navigate those three various options. Um, and, uh, and there would need to, be, uh, need to be that accessible route that coincides with the general public, which uh, for the general public would be stepping off the curb if, if this wasn't flush. This type of parklet represented here which can only be accessed by the sidewalk as the sides of the parklet prevent pedestrian movement into or out of this particular parklet is a great design choice. Again, they may need to locate or relocate the tables there to ensure there is a 36 inch path of travel onto the parklet, um, but it is a great design choice. Now let's look at the second photo on this slide. Uh, it shows two tables with two benches under the shade of a tree. Uh, however, it's in the middle of a field. Uh, and it's placed solely on grass in what appears to be a field. Uh, while, so my questions would be, where is the accessible route to these uh, seating and tables? Uh, and placing these newly created elements in the middle of a field does, just to remind, as a reminder, does trigger the accessible route obligation to get to that, those tables and seating. So let's then spend some time discussing off sidewalk access considerations for outdoor dining. Again, some of those items were discussed in the previous slide as they will be crossover obligations. So for example, is there an accessible route to the parklets or other off sidewalk dining locations? Is there ad adequate maneuvering clearances so people can maneuver around tables and allow for sufficient turning along with the appropriate clearances? And is there protection from protruding objects? Um, like on sidewalk dining, are there any off sidewalk attractions people may also attend? For example, are there fire pits out? Are there games being offered or other related attractions being provided to, uh, to work, uh, to try to you know, promote the outdoor dining activities? Um, I will discuss the technical obligations for the number of required accessible tables and their distribution requirements on the next slide, uh, but ensuring that there are accessible tables at these newly created elements will require that 5%, but not less than one uh, table provide the accessible uh, provide access, uh, I'm sorry, provide the access provisions also be distributed amongst locations with differing amenities. 
So for example, the covered parklet provided in the top uh, photograph that we discussed is considered separate from the adjacent on sidewalk lo sidewalk location um, uh, with different amenities. Uh, I'm so sorry, I just lost my place. Let me start over. So for example, the covered parklet provided in the, in the top photograph uh, is considered separate from the adjacent on sidewalk location that is uncovered. We're looking at different amenities, different experiences that can be had, even if there are two close but separate dining locations. So as you will see, while not every table would need to be accessible or necessarily be provided on an along an accessible route, it will, however, require that an established policy be set up to ensure that the accessible tables are filled you know, last, to ensure people needing those elements have an opportunity to have accessible tables available to them or will become available after the current diners are finished. And as mentioned before, an accessible route will need to be provided from the arrival points, which may be the host station that's either inside or outside of the dining establishment. Those, those accessible routes would be, need to be provided to the outdoor dining areas, to the restroom if offered to the public, as well as any other ancillary amenities or attractions offered on site that are directly related to outdoor dining. And lastly, if the on-street parking space, uh, or if on-street parking spaces are removed for the installation of parklets or street shutdowns, if those uh, changes impact the designated on-street accessible parking spaces, the municipality would need to relocate those spaces. Relocating the on-street accessible parking spaces to the first unchanged space or close to those would be needed. And for quick consideration, you'd want to relocate those spaces to where there's sufficient space and clearances for a lift to lower down uh, onto the sidewalk and, and being located close to a curb cut so someone without a lift-equipped vehicle could access the adjacent sidewalk quickly and not have to travel the entire block to find the curb cut up onto the sidewalk. So with that, I'm going to now move on to, um, we're gonna spend our remaining time here to discuss some specific technical requirements related to outdoor dining. And we have two pictures here, uh, actually three, uh, two photographs and one graphic. Uh, the top photograph shows a woman and her, I would assume her, her grandchild using a walker uh, on, on grass. Uh, we also have in the lower picture, we have um, some igloos that have been set up uh, to be used for outdoor dining. Um, and you're gonna find that igloos such as the ones displayed here could uh, you know, appear to have some access considerations because there is a, uh, of a, a four inch step that you would need to get over in order to access those igloos. Uh, and we also have a graphic from the Architectural Access Board's regulations that show table clearances that we will discuss in detail here moving forward. Um, most of, uh, as, as I had indicated that a lot of these dimensions, uh, I'll touch upon a lot of them now, but I will not be able to cover all of these items, but most will be found on the fact sheet related to this topic, which will be sent to you after our event. Uh, if there are, so let me start into that. If there are waiting areas or benches or queue lines, uh, those areas must be on an accessible route. Um, and if benches, let me just, I think. We switch interpreters, add, please. Thank you. Yep, we did. Um, I just wanna make sure the other interpreter was unspotlighted. So here we go. Okay. Uh, so if there are waiting areas or benches, uh, they need to be on an accessible route. And considerations for benches, again, not all of them, but for some of them, uh, you want some, uh, you want to provide potentially uh, to ensure that a shoulder to shoulder experience can be had with someone sitting on the bench, uh, with someone utilizing a mobility device. And are those benches that allow for a, are there benches that allow for a transfer from a mobility device to the bench? Not every bench, but some should have some of these features. Specific to the provision of accessible uh, tables, when determining the numbers, of how many accessible tables need to be provided. Um, one would need to count all of the tables within the entire establishment to determine the 5%, but not less than one to see what that actually means. For example, let's say a restaurant has 97 total tables. In this example, let's consider that tables are provided on the interior, they're provided on the sidewalk, they're provided within a parklet, and they're also uh, provided on a dock to a lake. 
using that formula of 5%, this would translate to needing from the 97, we need 4.9 accessible tables, rounding up to the nearest full integer, that's five accessible tables would be needed in this scenario, in this example. And continuing with this example, there are technically at least four separate locations of where those 97 tables are located. So the regulations require that the distribution uh, looks at the various tables offered and should be distributed by size and location throughout the space or facility. This obligation would mean that there should be at least one accessible table in each of the four separate locations. With the remaining accessible table, so remember you need five, so the, the fifth one can be provided at any of the four other locations as well. And remember, these are to be provided along an accessible route to all four locations, along with the policy of ensuring the accessible tables uh, are filled last. The accessible tables should provide the following. There should be a 36 inch clearance from the edge of the table to the next obstruction of a wall, uh, another seat or another object. This allows someone using a mobility device to have clearances to maneuver to those seating locations. Uh, the height of the tables should be no lower than 27 inches off the ground and no higher than 34 inches to the top of the table. This allows uh, someone seated in a wheelchair the ability to get under the table and not have the table too high to make it very uncomfortable, a very uncomfortable dining experience or create an unusable table scenario. Knee clearances uh, must also measure 27 inches high, hence the no lower than 27 inches to the bottom of the table. Uh, it needs to be 30 inches wide and 19 inches deep. Um, again, this allows for the minimal clearances so someone can utilize the table if using a mobility device. Tables on a pedestal base must also ensure that the base height does not exceed two inches in height. Um, anything higher can interfere with the required toe clearances or prevent someone using a mobility device from getting close enough to the table to use it. Not every table uh, can be considered accessible. It needs to have proper depths. So you can see 19 inches to the, uh, the graphic on the upper uh, right-hand side of the slide shows that there's a 19 inch depth to the base, uh, to the pedestal or the uh, upright uh, pole that's attached to the base holding the table up. Not every single uh, table is going to meet that requirement. So making sure you select the right tables to use in your outdoor dining is critical. At the accessible tables, the seating must not be fixed. Those seats must uh, be, mo be movable. Uh, there can be seats there, but they can't be fixed, uh, fixed seats. They must be movable um, so that people can move them out of the way to utilize the table. Access to other common elements need to be looked at as well. If the, if the toilets are open to the public, then those restrooms would need to be on an accessible route as well. If portable toilets are being provided, uh, then each location they, they are provided, even if, uh, even if on the same lot, the accessible portable tables must be provided at each separate location. They follow the rule of 5%, but not less than one uh, at each location, and also must be along an accessible route. Um, and as well as access to any ancillary elements, as we previously discussed, as, list, uh, as listed above, uh, such as warming station, hand sanitizer stations and self-serve stations. They also need to be on an accessible route to them. And if the elements have controls to, for use by the general public, are those controls operable with a closed fist, fist uh, that does not require grasping, twisting to operate? And are, are they located at a height no higher than 48 inches so someone can actually reach and activate those controls that they would have access to? Um, I have mentioned a lot of items in this segment. So I want to get to some questions to see if we can do some live questions and answers. And I know we are at the 1230 mark. If people need to leave, that is fine. Uh, if people have entered questions into the um, question and answer section, um, we would be happy to discuss uh, those questions. Um, I just wanna talk about this slide uh, at first. Um, there are five pictures on this slide. We've used them throughout the training. Uh, they are the same photos used throughout this program uh, that show the varying styles of outdoor dining, such as parklets, on sidewalk dining, the igloo dining, and uh, dining in a field. 
Uh, I would like to spend most of the remaining time, although we'd probably at least give 10 minutes to answer questions we've received. Um, I will read the question first uh, and then determine uh, who may be best able to answer it from MOD and we will provide an answer. And if we're unable to get to a question asked or if we don't have sufficient questions, by all means, you can email us um, and, if, uh, and, and, or, and we will get the answer back to you. So let me um, pause here for a moment. Um, I would like to just raise, uh, um, Naomi, if you could unmute yourself. I just would like to ask, have, are there any, uh, no, I'm sorry, I'm just double checking to see where the questions are and I'm seeing questions. Okay, great. So Naomi, you might not need to unmute yourself. Um, so a question, so I had a question uh, and this is uh, a pretty uh, easy one is uh, what's considered a selfie corner? Um, I've seen some of these in various cases where it's people leave, like it's a memory board or a board that's written in chalk that people can go and, and write on about their experiences, about whatever they might feel. A selfie corner is really some backdrop that someone could stand in front of while they're dining, usually to advertise the restaurant or, or outdoor dining situation. Uh, and people would take those pictures uh, and, and take them there. So those, those are kind of the selfie corners um, as, as well. Um, and I'm sorry, um, let me look at um, the next question. Um, Jeff, the questions are in Teams. Yep, and I am seeing oh. those, so thank you. And let me actually move them so I can actually see them easier. So I appreciate that. Um, so the question we have now is grass considered an accessible surface? Um, grass is not considered an accessible surface. Uh, grass, uh, it, it, the, the hard packed paved uh, uh, or uh, I'm sorry, a hard packed or paved surface is considered uh, an accessible surface. There are many different surface types out there. Some are more permanent than others. Uh, but grass is not considered an accessible route. Things like stone dust, obviously, uh, uh, the appropriate types of bricks uh, could be considered that, cement uh, and, and other remedies uh, would be considered hard packed or paved. Um, we have a, another question that says, can rope be used as a, uh, as a side of a pedestrian corral if it's higher than 27 inches? Um, in that reality, no, that, that there should be something that is is there that allows for um, someone use, utilizing a cane and their cane sweep uh, to identify an item of 27 inches uh, or lower that would identify that that's uh, uh, to, to maintain the corral, if you will, that was used in the question to make sure people are following and staying within that, that line. Um, you know, sometimes those are the pedestals that they might have um, or they might make sure the chain is low enough or is lowered enough or that the chain separators are, are not too far apart that a cane sweep would identify it. Um, another question we had, which is a great question, uh, protruding objects would include tree limbs, uh, I would assume, uh, and being, uh, and that, that is a good assumption. Yes, tree limbs, anything, anything that sticks out uh, more than four inches uh, from a wall uh, within that height range that we discussed as well as uh, anything mounted on a post that extends out 12 inches or higher or, or further in, within that same height uh, level uh, would, um, would be considered a protruding object. It would have to be remedied. So yes, tree limbs, they can be trimmed and cut back. Uh, and that applies not only to outdoor dining, but to pretty much every accessible route that, that, that we would think about. Um, and, um, uh, Moss, I would ask if you could just let me know when um, 10 minutes is up and then I will, um, I will move on to the closing remarks. Sure. Uh, in 10 minutes from when I started. So we probably have about seven or so minutes left. Uh, so the, the, the next question is, do, do restaurants have, uh, have to have accessible tables in the parklet if they have accessible tables on the sidewalk adjacent to the parklet? And I believe I addressed that, but I'll just restate that as indicated. Um, and we're going to, I'm trying to see if the, the photograph um, that we talked about in the, that is now in the upper left corner of the slide, which shows the dining, the on sidewalk dining locations close to the building, as well as on the outside of that same sidewalk with the enclosed level flush entry parklet. In that scenario, yes, the parklet also must provide an accessible table, uh, as it is a different experience. It is 
Um, you know, the, the, even though there are tables very close to it, it is also provided under cover in the parklet. Uh, and, you know, there might be in various scenarios, there could be other things or other options that might happen in that parklet that may not happen on the outdoor dining uh, that's provided on the sidewalk. So they are considered different elements. Um, let me see here. With a question that we also received, uh, with all of this valuable detail, is there going to be a handbook or searchable compendium for restaurants and municipalities to use as a guide? or use a user-friendly checklist. Um, we have developed a fact sheet that can be used um, that will, and that will be sent to all of the attendees here um, after the event. Um, and you, you will receive that um, fact sheet that will have pretty much a lot of what I've discovered, uh, discovered, what I, a lot of what I've discussed so far um, will be in that, on that fact sheet. So thank you. Um, there are checklists, and I will share this with you after as well. There is a checklist for ADA. Um, uh, it's something produced by the New England ADA Center. Uh, it's, it is an ADA checklist for existing facilities that could be utilized to at least kind of give you a base sense of, are these elements accessible? And I will try to indicate in, on the re uh, reply emails, uh, I will try to indicate the appropriate sections of that checklist, along with sharing the entire checklist with everyone. So thank you. Um, let me see what we have left. We have, um, okay, so the next question, uh, and we only have two questions left. Um, you mentioned providing alternate locations like closing a street for dining if it makes it accessible. How does this play with the Alcohol Beverage Control Commission's regulations on seating? Um, and have there been variances to the ABC regulations to allow accommodations? Um, I am unfamiliar with that, and I'm not sure if there's another MOD member on staff that might be able to weigh in on that. Um, uh, I have not played a role in that. I know as a member, with MOD being a member of the Architectural Access Board, we have dealt with some variants related to outdoor dining scenarios, such as uh, the accessible route and the use of portable ramps. Um, we've, we've been, we've um, been working on those. We have not worked with the uh, Alcohol Beverage Control Commissions, but again, they're probably yet another body that would need to be consulted, and that's now raises it not only from the municipality, but potentially to the state level as well, to ensure that outdoor dining is accessible. So whatever their controls are, we would want to make sure that equal access to the amenities that are being provided. So if there is street dining, and if that means restricting alcohol, then on street dining would um, would also have to provide accessible seating, but you wouldn't be able to serve alcohol. Um, again, again, this would be something the, the uh, Alcohol Beverage Control Commission would have to determine on their own. And I'm not really familiar with that process. So I'm sorry about that. Uh, in question, the final question, we have shown grass as a part of an accessible route for these temporary outdoor dining setups. Oh, and I think, and I have already believe, uh, answered that but the can grass be part of an accessible route that is temporary in nature. Again, I must reiterate, accessible routes are required and must be accessible with these newly developed uh, amenities. So as we discussed, uh, or, or a variance from the architectural access board would need to be sought if there's some extenuating circumstance. Um, and fi the final question I would like to get to, um, so uh, the final question, which relates to the accessible tables and the policy I was discussing, that uh, can the accessible tables be filled last? Um, are they only able to be used by people that need them or uh, as like as for reserved accessible on-street parking spaces? And in that scenario, um, if they are reserved to last, you would fill it um, with a person who needs it, who would need that function or need that am uh, amenity. And if none are present, then you could seat them for the next diner. And then again, you'd, you'd rotate it. So, you know, just to ensure that those tables become available frequently uh, for people who need them, because remember only if you had a hundred tables, only five of them would be usable for some people. So making the opportunities more available shows uh, or in having that policy in place shows the, the intent and good intention of ensuring that people will have equal access and opportunity to an outdoor dining experience at that restaurant. So at this time, 
I'm going to stop with a question and answer section, and I'm going to go to the closeout section, if you don't mind. Um, in any of these unanswered questions, which we've captured, um, we will uh, respond to uh, uh, directly. If, if a question has the correct uh, information, example, your email uh, isn't something that was already answered. And if, you're, uh, if you have a contact information was provided with your question, um, I will make sure to respond um, back to you directly. Uh, and if I feel it's appropriate enough, I will respond directly back to all of the attendees with your question. So thank you for the questions that were submitted. And I really wanna close up with, I would like to really thank you all for attending this event and the entire MOD staff for all the assistance and really pulling this together. Um, I apologize for the few hiccups, but hey, what's a virtual training without a few hiccups that happen? So I appreciate everyone's understanding. At the end of this training, all attendees will receive another email from, MO, from us that will provide you a fact sheet on the outdoor dining and seating. A request for future topics will also be asked in the email. Uh, while October and January, we've earmarked them, we're still looking for suggestions for July uh, and moving forward. Uh, appropriate responses to outstanding questions that we were unable to answer during this event will also be emailed to you. Um, as mentioned at the beginning, we also hope uh, with fingers crossed to have this event up on our YouTube page. Just visit YouTube and search for our channel, uh, Mass Office on Disability. If you are interested in other trainings that we offer, uh, please visit our newly and still being redesigned website at mass.gov forward slash MOD forward slash training, which is available on this slide as well. Uh, we have disclosure and employment workshops. We have community access monitor trainings, link to that the advanced community access monitor trainings, along with disability non-discrimination trainings uh, that are listed there, along with additional ones that you can see uh, and, and, and click on for more information. And finally, please use MOD as a resource. Uh, I provided here a way to contact us. Uh, 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 you can reach out to contact us either, either by mail, uh, although we are working from home. Uh, so you would want to reach out to us by our contact form, which you can go to our website and submit a question through our contact form or use this direct link here, uh, which is mass.gov forward slash MOD forward slash contact us, which is all one word, or dial our phone number here. You can also file, see how we are linked to the, we, uh, our webpage, our YouTube options, as well as uh, we, uh, our blog and our Twitter account are all ways to communicate with us. So with that, I wanna thank all of the participants uh, and, and attendees and all of the presenters, ASL and CART, as well as the entire MOD staff. Thank you so much. And I thank you for attending this webinar. Uh, 